Games from Folk Tales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. Tonight, The Lavender Dragon by Eden Philpott. I'm disappointed, dear listener. I thought I'd found a fantasy author who used the areas around Devon as his canvas, and if that were true, that would let me push the free material for Ars Magica further east to join up on the west with the free Cornwall and Bristol Channel material already available. The problem is that I've now discovered that Phil Potts abused his daughter for 30 years. It's very difficult to listen to his dragon pontificate upon the principles of an enlightened society when you know what the author was like. To salvage an episode, the core idea is still good for Ars Magica, so let's explore it in general. Decades ago, a dragon and his mate were ambushed by humans with crossbows. The female dragon died, the male dragon avenged himself, buried his partner, and decided this war between the species needed to end before his own people were entirely extinct. The only way to assure this was to improve the morals of humans. He sets up a community by abducting people who are outsiders and bringing them to his bride's grave, which is now a lavender-coloured hillock. Single mothers shunned by their villagers, artists, streamers, foreigners, minor criminals. As he collects people, they suggest others who might like to be collected. The humans build huts and eventually a walled town with the dragon's aid. The dragon helps them live a life somewhat better than the average medieval peasant, and so they have enough free time to consider, seriously, questions about how life should be lived. It's basically a rationalist utopia, sitting on the back of the muscle power of a dragon. Eventually, he even abducts a priest and helps him build a church because humans like that sort of thing. The story starts when a knight is hired to kill the dragon and is instead kidnapped to the Utopia. The dragon, it turns out, is dying. He's very old and has been kept in good health by the liniments of an alchemist who lives in the town. As the dragon gets weaker, people debate what to do after he passes away. At his death, his rule that people may not leave the community ends, the walls are cast down, some people stay on, particularly the younger ones who have no desire to join medieval English society. Others become missionaries for the town's philosophy and go back to their old villages. These become potential coven folk and plot hooks, respectively. The dragon himself, sensing his death approaching, designs a sort of platform on a metal track, so he invents the railway, and then he crawls up on it so that he's easier to bury when he passes away. He rests beside his wife in the hill, in the middle of the town covered in flowers. This is obviously of his source. That it was the lair of the dragon and the grave of two means it has an aura. The walls can be put back up pretty easily, and the dragon's defensive earthworks are still in place. It seems the dragon took his mate's body to some remote place before burial, so it's further suitable for a covenant. The whole novel is available from LibriVox and Internet Archive, and I was going to do one of my lengthy dissections, but seriously, once I found out what Phil Potts was like as a person, my desire to go through his work with a fine tooth comb vanished. I mean, why do that when I can do something like the discovery of witches instead. Your saga may vary.